thanks a lot. Uh, uh, it's uh, really great to see that we are quite uh, a group of people here uh, after this very dense uh, day of talks. Uh, it's also a nice uh, uh, classic environment in contrast uh, to the other side, which I, I find uh, nice and suitable somehow. Uh, so thanks uh, for inviting me to uh, present our, um, our uh, approach to nat natural language processing. Um, so uh, I somehow changed uh, the title, um, so to say it's not in, in terms of inconsistency. So the, the, the uh, uh, initial title of uh, democratizing NLP uh, is still through. You will see that uh, later on uh, with my slides. Uh, by the way, this is uh, the first time I show a new set of slides, so whenever there are uh, errors or so, um, um, please uh, forgive me for that. Uh, so what we try to do uh, is to actually uh, guide the classical natural language processing into something that we call uh, uh, language intelligence uh, that sort of uh, should be uh, similar to what uh, humans do with language. So uh, who are we? Uh, we are um, a startup company. Uh, it's uh, pretty uh, typical those days. Uh, we are located in Vienna, Austria. We started uh, with uh, initially a research project that had a rather naive approach. Uh, so I was uh, um, studying uh, a specific kind of neural networks, uh, namely uh, 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 the uh, system that is called hierarchical temporal memory from uh, a researcher uh, named Jeff Hawkins in, in California. Um, he is actually uh, more known, so to say, uh, for uh, his uh, invention of uh, Palm and uh, the, the first generation of handheld computings. Um, at some time, a couple, I think some 12 years ago, so uh, he completely switched over uh, to uh, become, so to say, a neuroscience researcher, and he came up with a, a theory on how the human neocortex actually works. So it's not so much about uh, how it is actually built, so it's not uh, the aim of uh, recreating, so to say, the neurons with their calcium channels and st stuff like that. It's also not so much about uh, the connectivity, mapping the connectivity through functions, which is another approach uh, to brain science, but he has the approach to try and find the principle of computation that is done uh, in the neocortex, and he has uh, created a theory that, at least me, uh, convinces me a lot, uh, much more than anything else uh, uh, I have found out there so far. And I took his uh, HDM theory, basically, um, as uh, a starting point uh, for our own work. So uh, we started this uh, with a research project that had the simple goal, so to say, uh, to feed text natively into this kind of HDM networks. And uh, basically everything that I will show you came out of this uh, first uh, approach we had. So in terms of company, we in the meantime got an investor. We have sort of a crew. We have uh, by, by, by the time now uh, a product uh, um, uh, on the market uh, that is uh, starting to be used by a number of uh, customers. So uh, we get traction also on the side of being useful to someone, which I think uh, is quite uh, important for a new approach uh, to show that it's uh, worth the effort. So um, the problem that we face is the famous big text data problem. Uh, so we are talking about big data um, a lot, uh, but in fact uh, um, a large part, if not even a bigger part, so this simulates sort of 50%, I, my personal guess it's uh, even more, is in fact text data, is uh, knowledge that is embedded into text and uh, there are enormous masses of text that are generated every day. Uh, um, if you just look at uh, Twitter feeds, at news feeds, at uh, websites, uh, research documents, so there's a lot of data that is produced every day uh, and we have to try and find a way uh, of processing this with adequate methods to actually um, get something out of it. Uh, what the current problems, uh, they have a couple of, uh, the, the current solutions for doing this uh, have a couple of problems. Uh, first of all, they are pretty hard to build. So uh, in theory, uh, if you listen to someone in, in NLP, uh, they speak about parsers, they speak about uh, creating document vectors and so on. So this 
tends to sound uh, sort of easy. If you actually try to do this practically, you will, you will find out that there are like uh, hundreds of little things you have to take into account and you have to tune and you have to figure out the right approach for the right collection of text. So there is a lot of know-how that is needed to actually create a useful uh, NLP system. Uh, so there are, of course, also commercial offerings. Uh, because they have to be very flexible and very powerful and very sophisticated. They end up being uh, pretty uh, expensive. Um, if you uh, uh, want then, if you do create such a system and you run it, uh, you face the problem that there is a lot of information that, is, that comes from ontologies, from dictionaries, from all sorts of uh, third-party information that needs to be updated uh, and maintained. So there is also a lot of effort uh, uh, to do in terms of running uh, an NLP uh, system. But uh, at least to my understanding, um, the, the biggest problem is that all work that is done with this uh, natural language uh, uses uh, a statistical approach. The problem is that language is actually um, a, uh, uh, encodes a symbolic, it's a symbolic encoding of the actual information. So you cannot actually take a word and do some computation with it. You first have to convert it into something that you can compute with. Because the words, as we see them, they are just strings uh, and they just represent something that you have to know that they represent. You have to know that uh, uh, CAT represents a cat. If you don't know this, you cannot do anything with uh, CAT other uh, than counting the number of occurrences of this word uh, in the material that you work with. And that is precisely the approach that uh, statistics basically use, is that they count the occurrence of words, they count how far or close words are, so to say, positioned in the text, and based on this very rudimentary information, I would say, uh, they try to infer um, um, the, the meaning or the, the deeper sense that you have uh, in text. And uh, this works, in fact. So this is already something astonishing. But it works only up to a certain limit. Uh, and I say this is the famous 60% rule. So you just uh, throw the, the algorithm in and you get immediately, so to say, if you don't do anything wrong, you get, get the precision of about 60% in whatever you want to do, basically. Uh, every further percent of improvement uh, tends to be very expensive. So either you have uh, to bring in people who give you hints and, and fill databases with information about this, um, or you have to bring in external data and so on. So every further percent of improvement is extremely uh, expensive and uh, I wanted to, tr to find a way uh, in getting this uh, much easier and uh, to raise the precision, so to say, systematically. The big problem, um, as I have said, is that the text is encoded in a symbolic fashion. So uh, in my understanding, uh, the fundamental problem is actually a problem of representation. So the question is, uh, how do we actually uh, represent words? So how do we do this uh, in our brains? So even that is, so to say, a topic for a lot of discussion uh, between uh, uh, philosophy and all sorts of disciplines uh, who try to come up with a theory uh, on how do we actually explicitly encode uh, language and, and words and sentences and things like that. So how can we convert the symbols into something that we can compute with? Because if we can't compute with, we will again fall back uh, on our statistical approach and uh, have all the inconveniences uh, we had there. Uh, and another point that is uh, very often, so to say, passed over uh, is the fact that whatever representation method we find, it has to be a method that actually allows two individuals uh, to communicate. So they have to be able to agree on the representation at least up to a certain point. <coughs> so our approach was uh, to say we don't take anything that uses uh, counting words or statistics. So the other idea basically, again, in a very naive approach, uh, let's try and see how the brain does this because obviously uh, natural language is produced by the brain, it's understood by the brain, uh, so there has to be something between our ears that actually knows how to process this data properly. So um, what I did basically is that I, did, I, I took the constraints uh, from uh, Jeff Hawkins' theory, uh, from the HDM theory, and I tried to apply this to my problem to sort of limit uh, the possible solution space 
uh, to something and actually find a solution. So let's just uh, look at uh, what these constraints are. Uh, so the neocortex is a 2D sheet. Um, so it's a structure that has, so to say, two dimensions. The reason why it's so wrinkled is it has to bring in a two-dimensional sheet into a small volume of the brain. And uh, if you observe it with the microscope, you will find out that you have sort of a repeating structure, like little modules uh, of neurons that are uh, repeated all over um, along the, the neocortex. Uh, by the way, uh, these structures tend to look always the same, uh, regardless uh, if you look to the visual cortex, if you look to the auditory cortex or, or any other part, it always looks the same. Uh, it even goes uh, a step further uh, because uh, even a, a pretty skilled uh, neuroanatomist uh, would have a hard time to find the differences between the neocortex of a human and a mouse uh, if he looks at it just uh, at the microscopic level. So it seems to be um, a stable structure across uh, uh, all mammals, basically. So the second thing is um, uh, the, the concept of saying the brain is actually not a processor, so it's not a von Neumann machine that has somewhere an accumulator and uh, has registers where you can input and output data, but as it looks the same all over, and as it is able to store information, obviously, uh, it should be looked as a memory system. So uh, I don't want to go uh, very deep into this, but I just want to uh, throw in the argument that uh, already in the 70s, I think, uh, people have experimented with something that is called a co content addressable memory. Uh, so there are concepts around already um, that show that you can actually do processing uh, by using memory uh, instead of using a processor. The actual role of the um, neocortex, according to the HTM theory, is to store pattern sequences. So there are basically data is continuously flowing in. Uh, and those patterns that uh, represent the data are stored in the sequence. So which pattern comes after which pattern, and if a certain sequence occurs more often, so to say, uh, the brain stores it. Um, another aspect is that it's an online learning system, so uh, we don't get, uh, uh, so to say, in a machine learning state before we are born, where we sort of get all the basic understanding of the world, and then we, we are born and we know everything. Uh, we are born without knowing anything, so it's sort of the blank slate uh, approach to the neocortex, and everything we know uh, we have learned ongoing. Yeah? So the system uh, has to have a structure that allows the continuous improvement without invalidating something that I've learned uh, in earlier states. Um, and then, and this is the key that actually led me to the solution that I will present. Uh, uh, the key aspect is that all data that is fed into the neocortex or that is coming out of the neocortex has a specific data format which is called a sparse distributed representation. Um, and the sparse distributed representation is basically a large binary vector that is very sparsely filled, so in the order of 2 to 5 percent uh, uh, maximum, which means a lot of zeros and uh, a small number of ones. And those um, SDRs, um, as we call them, um, they have properties again. And obviously, uh, if we want to process text, we have to convert this text into this representation format. Otherwise, it would be impossible to sort of uh, feed it into the cortical algorithm. So the constraints that come in from the uh, SDR aspect is, again, the data has to be a, a binary vector with about 2 to 5 percent filling. Um, every bit in this binary vector has to have a distinct self-contained semantic meaning about the thing I want to investigate. So, uh, for example, the visual information that comes in, every pixel tells you if it's part of an object that obviously covers a certain region of, of the image. It tells you the color. Uh, it tells you, so to say, uh, qualities that are expressed just by this uh, single pixel. So the same thing uh, is true, obviously, for all data that reaches the cortex. And um, so the, the, ex the fact of being explicit, we will see this later, uh, is specifically uh, important here. 
another fundamental aspect is that the representation as SDR, uh, there is a rule of thumb that says similar things have to have similar SDRs. So uh, if I have uh, a car of a Mercedes and a, a picture of a Mercedes car and a picture of another Mercedes, uh, the picture has to be similar to allow me to discover that both of the cars are actually Mercedes. Uh, and that has to be true for whatever data I, I bring in. Um, and the last rule, which is uh, the composition rule, that is also very crucial for our application, is that you can take a number of uh, different SDRs and you can group them together uh, to get, so to say, a union SDR, and that union SDR has to have the same uh, properties as the initial SDRs. So what actually happens, uh, just uh, to illustrate that a little bit, is that you have uh, information coming in, uh, in the case of language, it's symbolic information. You either hear it, you see it, you touch it, if you uh, read Braille, and uh, your output through the muscles, again, produces writing, or produces, uh, uh, so to say, symbolic information. But somewhere in one of the many areas of the neocortex, there has to be the appearance of an SDR that actually corresponds to a word. So we don't exactly know where this is or how this is structured, but at least we can use this concept to sort of uh, uh, bring uh, our theory further. And this uh, specific patch of uh, neuro tissue, if you want, to cortical tissue, uh, basically uh, we want to simulate that because that is fundamentally a, a converter where I can feed in uh, any form of text in a written form and what I get uh, is a proportional SDR representation of what the meaning of this text is. So uh, how do we do this? Um, we have called our system uh, the retina uh, because we claim it is sort of a, a sensorial organ uh, for text, yeah. So, and as our backend is a supposed uh, cortical uh, piece of uh, uh, tissue, we say, okay, we are the eye for text for this uh, cortical system in the background. So, what we do is that uh, to simulate uh, this uh, word layer, so to say, we have to teach it. We have, so to say, uh, to find a fast way of teaching it all what it needs to know about language that a normal person would learn, so to say, along uh, uh, the devel its development. So we took, uh, obviously, uh, um, the, the, the Wikipedia as an, as an offspring, so to say, of written text uh, of a certain quality. We have selected about uh, 400,000 pages from Wikipedia and we have pre-processed them in a specific way, namely to chunk it to, into little pieces that corresponds to something that we could call an utterance. Yeah? So uh, when we learn about language uh, in the beginning, we don't know how to read or write, so we mainly uh, learn, so to say, acoustically, and we try to simulate the amount of information that typically is, so to say, expressed in an utterance. So we cut the 400,000 Wikipedia pages in, in small snippets of two to three sentences. And this basically becomes a training collection. And this should contain everything that is relevant for actually understanding language. And because the brain is doing exactly the same thing. So we know language long before we go to school and learn about grammar or, or, or whatever. Then we have uh, the key of our um, algorithm, which is uh, called semantic folding, that uh, does a two-step two uh, process. One process uh, actually creates a semantic space out of the training collection. So what we do is we distribute all the training documents that we have, the little snippets, uh, in, on a two-dimensional two plane, so to say, and we try to organize them in a way, to cluster them in a way that uh, texts about similar things stay closer together and texts about diff uh, diff different things uh, stay f far apart, so to say. And this is a machine learning process that's the only uh, uh, floating point number uh, that is ever used in this whole system is to actually uh, create the semantic map. And when we have created the semantic map, 
uh, we then distribute our documents uh, on this map. So each of the training snippets uh, gets a, a coordinate basically on the map. And in the next step, we can take all the words that initially uh, occurred in the training document. And for each word, we light up uh, the positions where the word occurred in the text. And by doing so, uh, what we get is basically uh, the binary vector directly uh, that corresponds to the SDR. And I will show uh, that uh, it actually does uh, in the next uh, steps. So uh, when we have generated, uh, this was the offline process. So we do this one time. We ingest, so to say, the training material. And we end up with a trained retina that corresponds uh, let's say to a human who has done a certain amount of education, has read about certain topics, all of which in our case uh, come from Wikipedia. The online process, so the using of the system, uh, is very simple because we have one large database that basically has a, um, so to say, a, a, a word and a, a representation for the word. And then we can start to interact with this. And the point is, uh, which I will show uh, in, the, in the next slides, that uh, the representation is so explicit that by, without any further training or, or machine learning approach, we can extract all the information we need to do actual natural language processing just on text that is represented in this different way. So that you can, uh, so to say, imagine, uh, it's a bit unsharp. That looks too complicated to get it sharp, sharper. Um, what you should be able to see here, in fact, um, are four fingerprints. Uh, the central one is for the word organ. And as you should see, again, there are little dots. And each of the dots uh, basically corresponds to a context, uh, namely a real context, because we generated the context from actual text. Uh, 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 represents the context in which the word organ has appeared. And because we have this topographic arrangement uh, of the context, we have the situation that the word organ, for example, has a similar cluster with the word piano. So uh, you could see that those two clusters here match with the two clusters there, which basically directly tells us, without even knowing what organ is or what piano is, that the word organ and the word piano have a context where they are very similar, because they have those very similar patches next to it. The interesting thing is that organ, of course, could mean several things. Organ could also be uh, the organ of a, uh, uh, in a body. Uh, so if I compare it to one of those organs, the liver, uh, for example, I see that at another position in my representation, I have another cluster that matches with the representation of liver. And the same thing is true as organs tend to be in churches and they are sort of related to Baroque or, or whatever, uh, that there is an overlap between organ and church. This means that the word organ uh, in our representation actually contains all the senses in an explicit fashion because all the senses are represented by bits, so to say, that are in common with the bits at the same position of other words where you have an overlap. And that basically is the basic principle uh, that we found out uh, in the first step. And so the goal was basically to send words as, we, as the system reads them, uh, converted into this format into an HDM network. But then we started to do a couple of experiments and we found out that even without any further machine learning uh, using this data, we can already uh, create many different things and I will detail that out uh, uh, in the next slides. Uh, for now, I just want uh, to expand a little bit uh, on the training process. So as I said, uh, we have trained the system to produce this kind of representation using the Wikipedia. Uh, what if I would like uh, to have a system that is an expert in organs and knows all the little differences and aspects that are relevant to organs? So what would I do in reality? I would speak to someone who has read a lot about organs and who has worked in this field and who has a much richer, uh, so to say, representation than this. And probably if I would have taken the material that such a person has read 
as the training material for my retina, I would have a much more detailed, so to say, representation. Um, and that is basically the only way how you can tune this system, because there are no parameters or anything you could, so to say, refine. Uh, and here, as a comparison, again, it's a bit hard to see with, with the beamer. Uh, you see the, the word uh, cholecystitis, uh, which is a, um, um, so to say, a medical term. And you see the interpretation based on the Wikipedia data. And just by looking at the fingerprint, you immediately see that if you take uh, data from the National Library of Medicine to train your retina, you get a much richer interpretation. But what is uh, very interesting is the fact that, you, that we have found a way of aligning those two semantic spaces. So regardless of the resolution by which I actually analyze uh, the words that I ingest, I can maintain the same topography. This means that a person that uh, was only trained on Wikipedia can have a, an exchange or a, or a conversation, if you want, with someone uh, who has uh, uh, ingested the National Library uh, of Medicine because uh, the topography actually overlaps. So there might be words that occur in either one of the collections that don't appear in the other, but for the words that they actually share, so those two retinas could talk about medical issues, while the Wikipedia retina would be rather simple-minded, let's say, uh, and the other one would be the specialist. Um, this can be extended even further, because uh, if you take uh, uh, the retina in uh, French or Spanish or Russian, and you do the same alignment of the spaces behind, uh, you end up with fingerprints, as we call them, by the way, uh, of words that are similar if they mean the similar thing. So what you have here is the word philosophy in English in all those languages. And on the top uh, layer, you see the, the, the representation as fingerprint. Uh, and under it, you see the language in, in which it, it is uh, expressed. And unfortunately, so if the image would be sharper than that, you would see that they basically look nearly the same but they have little differences. I mean, the word uh, philosophy has a slightly different meaning uh, in English uh, than it has possibly in German or French. Yes, there are small differences, but 99% of the meanings are the same, and that's about what you see here uh, represented. And basically that allows us uh, to treat language independent of language, so to say. Uh, just by uh, processing what is represented by the language. Okay, so um, our core technology, if you want, uh, is uh, semantic fingerprinting. That's the process of converting any piece of text into a semantic fingerprint and to basically use one fundamental operator, which is the comparison. So we define the whole world of uh, text and, and language production by comparing its bits and pieces. And that's uh, at least our claim, uh, something that we humans do when we say we think about something or uh, uh, we work uh, on some information. Very often this can be simulated by doing this kind of analogy uh, processing with the explicit representation uh, of semantic fingerprints. Um, this basic operation basically uh, looks as simple uh, as it sounds. You have two words, uh, you convert them into a fingerprint, uh, you create an overlay, and you can immediately see how many pixels do they share, the words, so how much overlap do I have between word one and word two. And on the other hand, because I have this to topological representation, I can also say what are the topics in which they overlap, because two words might overlap in one aspect but not in another. And here I, I, don't, I, I do not have just the quantitative description, typical output of statistical approaches, but I also have a qualitative uh, uh, description. And actually, because every single pixel is explicit, I can dig into every single uh, pixel that you can see and I can sort of read out the context that this pixel describes and I can even formulate a description of what the overlay, overlay of the two words uh, corresponds to. Um, here we see this uh, 
fuzzy, but practically, uh, the words uh, cat and dog, they obviously share certain aspects in terms of uh, biology, they share aspects in terms of uh, animals that live with humans in the, in the uh, household, but they have also differences. And I, just by looking at the overlay, I can actually qualify all these different uh, aspects about the semantic similarity. Another thing I can do by just applying the similarity idea is that I can automatically disambiguate any word or any piece of text. Let's assume we have the word apple. Uh, I convert it into the fingerprint. Then I ask my system, uh, show me the word that has the most similar fingerprint to the word apple. And because we have trained on Wikipedia, the most similar fingerprint is, of course, computer. Uh, so computer is the most similar, has the biggest overlap with the word apple. Uh, in a second step, I take all the overlapping bits between computer and apple and I take them away from Apple, so that I have an Apple without the computer aspects. And now I ask again, what is now the most similar uh, word to this remaining non-computer Apple? And I get the word fruit. Now I can do, continue the same. I take all the overlapping bits with fruit, I take them away from the non-computer apple and I make it a non-computer, non-fruit apple. And I ask again and I get records because there has been the, the Beatles records uh, um, company called Apple, and so on. And I can do this with any word in any language. I can find out based on the corpus that I've actually trained, so on the books I've actually read, uh, what the different interpretations of a single word uh, uh, could be. And uh, this ends, so to say, in a form of expression building that I can create and I can start, you remember, I, I needed a representation that allows me to actually uh, compute with words. So what we do here is that we find out that if I take a Porsche away of a Jaguar, then the remainder is a tiger. Uh, and again, this is a simple Boolean logic applied to explicit features uh, within, within the representation. Um, and now the, so to say, uh, Last uh, um, constraint that we have to comply with um, is the, the forming of the unions of these representations. Uh, and we need this if we want to process more complex structures than words. So if we want to convert um, a sentence into a fingerprint, what we basically do is we convert every single word into its fingerprint. What you should be able to see but probably can't see is um, just as a um, side effect. Uh, because we treat every word exactly the same way. So we don't have stop words, we don't have function words, we don't do stemming. We take a string of words as being an information entity that we work with. Interestingly, uh, words that are actually function wor words like uh, to, on, there, and so on, uh, if you look at them, you will see that they have a pretty even distribution uh, of the pixels. They have not much structure because they occur in many different contexts, so there is no, not a specific type of context where you will find the word to, you will probably find it in every second uh, sentence in English. Uh, and if you look at the nouns, you will uh, even see in the blurry picture that there are clusters uh, all over, there is structure. So what happens is that when we stack those words together to actually form um, the, the, the fingerprint for the whole sentence, uh, we will build up little towers, so to say, where the number of bits that are on a specific position uh, pile up and we define a certain threshold where we cut it because we have to maintain the 2% to 5% fill grade. Otherwise, the representation will not be an SDR anymore and then everything will not be true. So we have to do this. And as you can see, um, uh, words that have a very distributed representation will basically get lost by this way because uh, only the words that actually have clustered structure in the representation uh, will remain. And in the end, you have a fingerprint that basically represents the sentence and behaves exactly the same way as the fingerprints for the words. So you can even interchange them and compare words with sentences and stuff like this. Uh, practically, um, you have uh, two sentences. Teens like playing good music with their mobile phones. These are, by the way, actual fingerprints, so this is not, uh, uh, not fake. 
Um, and uh, you can also consume chart hits with your notebook. Uh, obviously, they have, so to say, a certain semantic closeness, those two sentences, but they don't actually share uh, uh, um, any word. And you have an overlay overlap uh, of about 27%. If I change the second sentence to the fishermen are sailing out of the harbor, uh, it drops down to 9%. Uh, so obviously, this has some uh, proportionality to how close two sentences are in a semantic fashion. You can even see that uh, there are clusters from the other sentence that are completely missing over here. You might ask yourself why there are still 9%. Uh, in fact, uh, and I have to, to add this third slide, uh, what I found out is that both of the sentences speak about people, and that's, so to say, the level at which they are linked. If you change a fisherman into fisher boat, uh, it actually drops to 3%. So you have really a very uh, sensitive way of uh, representing the meaning in, in the different sentences. So what we can do with this, uh, so the immediate use is, of course, uh, to create a search engine. Uh, that you can do very easily by taking a collection, for example, that you would want to index, as you would index it with a, with a, a regular search engine. And here the indexing is just the conversion of each of the documents in your collection into a fingerprint. And the query that you bring in could either be an example document, so I want all the documents that are more or less like this, or you can simply type in what you're interested in uh, and I, 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 I then create a fingerprint of it. And searching is nothing else than just matching the distance, uh, Euclidean distance, cosine distance, whatever. We have a couple uh, of distance measures available um, between the two. And the interesting thing is that already on this level, uh, there is an advantage, uh, so to say, over the traditional search engine technology because we have a generic ranking mechanism here. We can just use the distance as being the direct ranking of the result set. Uh, whereas uh, the, uh, who already worked with search engines, you know that uh, this can be a pretty synthetic uh, endeavor to, to rank results properly, uh, if done statistically. Um, <coughs> but what is more, even more interesting is that in the very early days of search engines, there was this request or definition of search engines that it's not only about finding information in documents, but it's actually matching the information need of a user with the information contained in documents. So it has to take the user into account. So if we want to do this in our case, uh, we just imagine we create an index of patent documents, let's say, um, and we have two people who want to search in this uh, patent collection. Uh, we have an engineer who has mostly engineering and uh, technical aspects by which uh, he looks at the patents. And we have a patent lawyer who is more interested into the legal aspects. So each of them uh, provides me with like two or three documents that where it says, okay, this is typical, typical kind of information uh, that I work with. So the lawyer will give me some legal uh, text and the engineer probably some, let's say, scientific paper or whatever. And now what I can do is that um, both of them send in the same query, or they say, I'm interested in this patent, show me similar patents. Um, I will get the result in the way how I, how I said before. I, let's say, take the 100 top results from this query, and now instead of ranking it directly to the difference, uh, to the distance between query and document index, I rank them to the distance of the fingerprint of my reference documents that I provided initially, uh, which means that the two users will get two different result sets. And therefore, uh, so to say, this is the first, at least to me, uh, consistent way of matching with this idea of uh, taking the user uh, into account. And again, there is no training, no machine learning. This is really just matching of bit patterns, nothing more. Uh, and not, oops. It was too fast. Another um, example uh, uh, is, of course, classification, which is a typical NLP task. Um, so what we want to do here is we want uh, to classify animal names uh, into mammals or not mammals. What we do, uh, we have to create a fingerprint that actually specifies the class. Uh, the specification of the class is done by literally taking those three words 
creating a fingerprint out of those three words, mammal, mammals, and mammalian, and then compare it with the words dog, cow, elephant, spider, and so on. And we will see uh, that for the actual mammals, there is, so to say, a hotspot uh, here, where if there are a lot of dots in this region, the animal is a mammal. If there are not a lot of dots, then it's not a mammal. And it has about a precision of 90% or more, depending on the frequency of the, of the animal. And again, no training of the classifier or any other aspect of the setup. This is just passive Boolean uh, word processing. Uh, so uh, for the more scientific uh, people in here, uh, we use um, uh, um, a number of publicly available uh, training sets uh, to do the evaluation of our algorithm. So of course we try to improve it continuously, so we need a way uh, of figuring out uh, if the last coding step actually led to an improvement or not. Uh, so we use uh, uh, several evaluation methods. One of the most immediate is the semival, the so-called semival evaluation. Uh, what happens there is that uh, there are collections of word pairs, uh, like, uh, I don't know, Socrates, Plato, uh, and so on. And uh, there are human assessors who actually say with a score, let's say between one and five, how close the two terms are semantically. And uh, what we try to do is basically to get as close as possible to the human judgment by using uh, our um, uh, distance measure. And uh, by doing so, um, in our very first try, uh, where we did not optimize it for anything, we just throw the data in uh, and got uh, the matching result out, uh, we found out that we outperformed uh, um, the, the Google word to vec uh, for example, which has been until then, uh, so to say, the best way of doing a computational uh, semival calculation. And the interesting thing is we didn't improve it by 1% or 2%, but really by 30% and more, uh, which basically explains, it can be explained by the fact that we use a completely different way of getting to this data uh, than the statistical approach. I mean, uh, uh, the word to vec algorithm to perform in this quality there uh, had to in ingest uh, 20 billion uh, web pages. Uh, we have just used 400,000 um, Wikipedia pages to get a better result. And basically, this is the uh, improvement that the semantic folding algorithm brings in, because the representation for the text has much more what I call semantic payload than a statistical representation that needs a lot of examples to even have a little bit uh, of semantics uh, captured in the representation. So, uh, yeah. Um, Business-wise, we have figured out a number of environments where we think uh, that uh, our technology can be used. So you will find a lot of uh, familiar building blocks for apps and uh, uh, startups and so, so on. So we can uh, search for documents uh, either on local networks uh, or on the web. Uh, we can match people. So there's currently due to the uh, social networks, there are many descriptions of people. So if you go to LinkedIn and you visit uh, the page uh, of someone, uh, you will find that there is this description about the person that the person actually wrote uh, uh, herself. And if you make a fingerprint of this self-description, you can literally compare by overlap the matching of, uh, so to say, the professional profile of two people by just matching uh, the fingerprints. This is highly, highly correlating. Uh, you can do the same thing with descriptions of uh, products, for example. You can convert the description of a product into a fingerprint, and you can compare it to another product and make a better guess on what other product uh, could be of interest for a certain customer. Or you match it with the fingerprint of the LinkedIn profile to find out if that user is uh, at all interested in this kind of products, and so on. 
Then you can use it, of course, for data mining. Uh, if you have huge uh, repositories of, let's say, research reports, you can uh, look for patterns in that. Uh, you can avoid uh, duplication of work. So uh, if you are working on a PowerPoint presentation and the system finds out uh, there is on the web server uh, a PowerPoint presentation that already has three slides that are very similar in semantic terms to what you are about to do, uh, if you get, uh, so to say, a warning, you save time. Uh, you can use it uh, for advertising, so what advertisement uh, should be presented. Again, semantic matching ma makes a lot of sense. Uh, and of course, you can uh, use it in uh, security and government uses like uh, collecting evidences or monitoring for uh, illegal behavior or things like that. So fundamentally, what you can say is whatever can be expressed uh, by text can be converted into a fingerprint. And by being converted into a fingerprint, it can be compared to anything else where you have a fingerprint of. Um, a very practical uh, first application that we have tried uh, is to take the Twitter firehose. And something I always wanted to do is to create a content-based substream of the Twitter firehose. So if I'm interested in, let's say, natural language processing and artificial intelligence, uh, I would like to have a way of getting only tweets about this. But in fact, this is pretty hard to do. First of all, there are a lot of tweets that come along. So whatever method you find, it has to be a very fast method to cope with like 15,000 messages a second. Uh, and the second is how do you actually formulate uh, what you want? In a traditional approach, you would create a list of finger, of, uh, not fingerprints, but of keywords. Uh, that basically cover more or less what you mean. And then the system would just look for these keywords in every message that comes in, which means 15,000 times a second. So you can buy such a system uh, from IBM. It's basically uh, built into two racks of servers uh, that do this uh, in real time, so to say. So in order to do all the string matching uh, fast enough, uh, in our setup, uh, we create, um, we convert every tweet that comes in into a fingerprint, and every subchannel that we want to create is represented by a filter fingerprint that basically specifies what I'm interested in. So I would say uh, natural language processing and artificial intelligence, aggregate this to a fingerprint, and then I would uh, measure the overlap with every incoming uh, a tweet fingerprint, and whenever there is more than, let's say, 30% overlap, I take it in my basket, then it's uh, probably interesting for me. And it turns out, uh, to create this application, it just takes an Apple notebook. We do this in real time on a notebook uh, to convert all the 15,000 uh, um, tweets per second uh, into fingerprints. Uh, takes just a desktop processor. The reason for that is obvious. We do only Boolean operations on very simple data structures, namely binary strings. So there is no uh, uh, matrix, floating point multiplication, stuff like that. It typically takes a long time to do this kind of evaluation. And uh, because the comparison of two fingerprints is very, very effective, as you can imagine, in a typical modern uh, CPU, you can make use of many, uh, so to say, hardware features. So we end up, uh, again, on a desktop CPU with about 500,000 compersions per second, which means if you want to offer this uh, filtering service as a, as a professional service, you just put another notebook next to it, and you basically serve uh, 100 customers uh, with the individualized uh, Twitter feeds. Yeah? So uh, as I said, uh, I, I'm coming back to the idea of uh, democratizing NLP, making it simpler. Uh, here, for example, instead of having a very complicated management of my keywords to specify what topics I'm very interested in, I have very intuitive ways of uh, creating, for example, those filter fingerprints. So I can just use keywords. Yeah? So I can even use the keywords I have already created for the previous version. But this time, those keywords will be 
convert it into fingerprints and have a much richer representation, of course, than just the literal string of the keywords. Um, I can take text documents. If I have a description of something that is relevant to me, uh, I can use this text to become the filter and I will get similar stuff uh, out of that. I can even use uh, information that I get somewhere from a social network or whatever. As I said before, whatever source of text you have, uh, you can convert it uh, into a fingerprint. We have even uh, little applications online to either build uh, expressions, things like the Jaguar minus Porsche, to specify what you mean, uh, or, uh, uh, that's my favorite, it's a paint program where you can actually draw the picture of your fingerprint uh, by hand, and you can drill down in every pixel to find out uh, what it means, so I, I typically take this to refine uh, any, any filter that I have set up. So here you see again um, the uh, application of matching people uh, by using their uh, LinkedIn descriptions. Uh, here you have a product recommendation by taking uh, the description of products and matching them. Um, so this should lead to a better uh, recommendation uh, circuit than currently. I mean, I recently bought a, an espresso machine and for about a month, I had in every web page that had Amazon ads, I had an ad for espresso machine. Uh, although I'm probably the last person who will buy a second espresso machine uh, shortly. Okay, so to wrap up, um, uh, I just want to sort of bundle the arguments uh, that uh, speak for our approach. Uh, and I think the most important and therefore the reason why this should be should have a de democratizing effect is simplicity. You can very intuitively uh, develop concepts on how you want to handle the semantics of certain text and what you want to happen if the uh, overlap is uh, su sufficiently large and things like that. Um, it's very intuitive. It works with all sorts of text, with short text like words, with long text. Uh, you can also decide if you have a book uh, you cut it into pieces and you create several fingerprints for each chapter. So it's all up to you how you want to apply it, what resolution in your comparison you want to have. The mechanism uh, for doing so is always the same. You just send the text and you get back uh, the fingerprint. Um, it can be very easily expanded. So for example, uh, if you use uh, the API to create an application, uh, by just pointing your application from the English retina to the French retina, it will do exactly the same thing in French without changing one line uh, of code. Uh, and of course, there is nothing to configure, so uh, you just do what you want to do and it should work uh, in principle. Then of course, the efficiency. Um, the fingerprints are very small. Uh, they are um, a binary vector, so there is not really a, a smaller way of representing information than uh, using bits. Uh, at least I'm not aware of. Uh, maybe the qubits, but uh, it probably still takes some time. Uh, the only operators we apply to this are Boolean operators. Very easy to understand intuitively. And uh, the, the equal sign, if you want, is uh, the comparison function, which is the actual only function that we use on the data. And we have extremely high throughput. So in, in, uh, in average, we tend to be one uh, up to two uh, orders of magnitude faster than the same solution using statistical approaches. So, and for, as I said, big data, uh, speed is a factor. Uh, because if you are able to ingest uh, four terabytes of Twitter data or news feeds or whatever uh, in, in a couple of minutes, uh, that simply makes a difference uh, if you get this in a couple of minutes or if it takes uh, a week uh, to actually process. And uh, the third argument, of course, uh, is the argument of quality. Uh, what uh, was basically shown by comparing it to other semantic uh, uh, measurement uh, methods, uh, namely the fact that we have 16,000 features and that they are explicit, so you can drill down in every single feature and find out why a certain overlap happens in a certain location. You can even get the, the, the words, so to say, that specify uh, this pixel. Uh, um, therefore, you have always the, the, the comprehension side of the text uh, under control. And whatever you do, whatever 
calculation method, you, whatever sequence of Boolean operators you apply to the fingerprint, it will be true for any language. So you, again, you can develop in the language you speak um, and when you want to in, uh, uh, internal, in, uh, have an interna international version of it, you just switch uh, to another language retina. Or you just switch from the Wikipedia retina to a dedicated medical retina if the production system should uh, be used in a medical context or whatever. Um, and of course, there is a, a way of updating uh, the information that has been ingested uh, into the retina. So whenever uh, the system actually sees a new word where it has no fingerprint for it, it basically again does the same thing as we humans. It takes the message in which uh, this new word appeared as the new fingerprint because that's the only information that is available to describe uh, this new word. And uh, for a certain time when this word occurs more often, uh, it will, so to say, complete uh, this uh, intermediate uh, representation Again, same as we do. Just imagine uh, you are following a news feed uh, and uh, there is a new prime minister in uh, 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 Greece, let's say. Uh, so you never heard his name before and today you, you hear the name the first time. So what do you know? You know his name, uh, first prime minister, Greece. That's about what you know and that's what you could build your fingerprint of. And uh, after, let's say, 10 news messages, you have much more information. And of course, you will have the 10 messages aggregated uh, in the provisional fingerprint for the name. So it can, as you see, uh, very organically uh, improve this. So that's basically it. Here are some uh, references where you can see uh, the demos and so on. And I think I do have some two minutes or so. Uh, I will try something that one should never do to give demos online. I will simply try this. The problem here is the screen size. I immediately see. Um, I will try. It doesn't. Sorry. It's not that easy with this low resolution. Okay. So this, by the way, you can find on our website. You can uh, play with this uh, yourself. I just want to point you at my favorite one, which is uh, this here. That's the cross-lingual. So, okay. Uh, what this does, basically, is you can enter any piece of text here. Uh, the system will detect what language this is in and will calculate the uh, fingerprint for this piece of text. Uh, and what it does then is we have here retinas in Chinese, Danish, English, French, German and uh, a couple of others, I think. Uh, Russian, Spanish, Arabic and so on. And what we do basically is we take the fingerprint, so the numeric representation of what the text contained, and we ask every retina what are the most similar terms that you have in your system, uh, most similar to this text fingerprint that I created. So basically it should give us back contextual terms that are somehow topic-wise related to the text. So this text uh, is about Hawkins, I think, the physicist, yeah, Stephen William Hawkins, exactly. And uh, what you see is uh, that the terms in English are cosmology, physicist, and so on. In French, you have cosmology, physicien, relativité. In German, Russian, I guess, uh, is probably also. Uh, what, what you see here is basically the proof for the fact that the fingerprint representation is actually independent from the language used. Whenever we manage to have aligned semantic spaces behind the creation of the fingerprint, the fingerprints are completely interchangeable, which practically means that you can compare a text about Stephen Hawkins in English with a text about Stephen Hawkins in Chinese, and you should get a large overlap. And uh, as far as I know, uh, no one else was able to do this so far uh, unless using a statistical machine translation or whatever brute force method in the back. 
Good. Any questions from your side? Thank you.